This lecture is even more detailed than last time. We're going to spend a little bit of time going into some gory details uh, here and there. Today is definitely one of those days. Hopefully not too gory, though. I think you'll find it is at a good level of uh, information, and it'll certainly help you be oriented around how Pinto's threading works and how these things work in general. And hopefully it'll give you a framework for reasoning about these things. So that's why, even though it is definitely detailed today, uh, I hope it'll be of, of great benefit. So uh, last time we introduced the concept of kernel threads, which is the mechanism that the OS kernel uses for building multitasking. It's the thing that allows me to share the processor across multiple logical control flows within the kernel. And so we add this uh, kernel thread thing, which is the thing that the OS kernel schedules and the scheduler knows how to manipulate manipulate these things and to switch back and forth between them. So kernel threads are the thing that the OS kernel knows how to manipulate when it comes to concurrency. And they are very lightweight. They tend to be very small. You'll see this as we go through the discussion today. They tend to have register state, flag, stack pointer. They'll have a, a space for the stack that tends not to be very large because we don't want to have very deeply nested operations inside the kernel. We want to spend as little time in the kernel as possible. So having a small kernel stack helps us to uh, make sure that we do this um, very carefully. So um, the kernel thread may or may not correspond to a user mode process. This is what we were talking about last time. Uh, it isn't the thing that actually holds the resources. Those will be in a separate structure typically. Um, colloquially, it's called the process control block, but it may be called other things in an OS implementation. But that thing will be associated with a kernel thread that runs on behalf of the process. Okay, We'll talk about some of those details as we go through this. We do want to um, remain in the kernel for as little, short, uh, as little time as possible, so that's why the kernel thread uh, stack tends to be small. Here are some examples. Um, this is the uh, Linux kernel thread stack. Now, this is probably on uh, IA32. I don't know what the x86-64 Linux um, thread uh, stack size is, so I'd have to go look that up. But uh, you can see it's very simple. It's 8 kilobytes is all that the um, kernel has to use for the thread stack. And uh, as I mentioned here on the slide, um, all of these tend to be multiples of four kilobytes, or I really should say four kibibytes because it's 4,096 bytes, because that's the size of a virtual memory page for the x86 architecture. Okay, Windows has a couple of different kernel thread stack sizes. It'll either do 12 kilobytes or 24 kilobytes, depending on the, uh, the processor architecture that you're running on. It's not a lot of memory anymore, so why not give a little bit more memory for the kernel thread stack? And Pintos, which is very relevant to all of you, has four kilobyte kernel thread stack. So just a single virtual memory page. That is certainly not the only page that is allocated for a thread, particularly if the thread is running on behalf of a process. There will also be the process information, uh, virtual page table, which will take up multiple um, pages of memory and so forth. So it just, and, and uh, the stack itself for the process will grow as the user process runs as well. But the kernel thread thing itself has to live in four kilobytes. Okay, I wanted to dive a little bit into how this works because it is helpful to know. And as you're going through the thread code in Pintos, it's kind of nice to know what all the files are doing so that you know where to poke around in when you're trying to understand something. So the kernel thread has to be created. There's a function in Pintos in particular called thread create that's used to set up the kernel thread information. And the stack obviously has to be configured to work with the other parts of the OS, namely the thing that switches to it because that's the first way that that thread will start executing is it'll be ready and then the thread switcher will have to switch to it somehow. So we need to initialize the kernel thread state so that that mechanism works uh, correctly. So this is the way that it's often laid out. 
where the low address is at the bottom of the box and the high address, you know, let's say four kilobytes is at the top of the box. And so you'll have some kind of thread information struct that's at the bottom of that space because on x86, the stack grows down. So initially the stack pointer would be at the very top of this block. And then what happens is the OS kernel plops down a couple of stack frames as if functions had been invoked. So you have to know the function call uh, mechanism. You have to understand what the calling convention is for functions. And uh, you know, fortunately, this is something that none of you have to deal with because it's just, um, this is the stuff that's already provided for you in Pintos. But you've got a frame for the thread function that does the thing that the kernel thread is supposed to do. And so you have a frame on there so that when you actually get to that point, the thread function has its context to run with. Uh, and then you have another frame below it because it'll be popped first um, for the thread switcher that will contain the initial machine context and also will tell the uh, thread to start running the thread function. Okay, so all of this stuff is set up and obviously the reason why the thread information at the bottom is super important is because that's the thing that says where the stack pointer should start. And so clearly that needs to point to the bottom. It's really confusing on x86. It's the bottom of the, the range of data because it goes up from there, but it's also called the top of the stack because it's the first thing that would be popped if you were to pop something off of the stack. So it's a little bit confusing, but that's the idea. There's um, one interesting detail that I should tell you about for Pintos. Um, let me actually throw some of this stuff up here because there's no reason not to hide it. I mean, not to show it. Um, but the way that the thread information is laid out is the very uh, top value in this thread info struct. And when I say the top value, I mean the last value. Again, this is going to be really confusing because of memory layouts. But the last value in the thread information struct in Pintos is a magic number. And so that ends up getting the largest address when you're laying it out, which means it's at the top of the thread info struct if you're looking at it from the low address to the high address. And so there's a magic number right here. And the purpose of it is that if the stack gets too large and you'll run into this if you try to put a big array or a big buffer on a function frame and uh, as a local variable and then the kernel thread stack may be overflowed and that magic number will be trampled. And Pintos will detect that there's corruption. So it's trying to help you out to keep you from, um, you know, overriding this uh, information that's at the bottom, like so that the stack doesn't grow too large. But that's generally the idea of how the kernel thread stacks work. Does anybody have any questions about that? You will run into all of this stuff. You can see the uh, the sort of the references on the slide. You can just go read the source code. It's pretty straightforward. It's not really magical. There's a few minorly magical things, particularly in switch.s, and we'll be talking about those again in the future. What is the magic number there for? Just for detecting corruption. You got it. That's all that it's there for. Detecting stack overflows that would trample over the thread information and basically your, your thread uh, self-annihilates. That's all it's there for. Any other questions? Okay, so we'll go on. If you think of anything else, feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, kernel control paths, um, this is a, a term that you'll hear discussed a lot. So you already heard me use the term logical control flow and a, con a kernel control path is basically the same thing. It's just a logical control flow through the kernel as we handle some kind of interrupt that occurred. So a trap or a fault or a hardware interrupt that we're responding to in the kernel. So you have this kernel control path that you're going through executing code in the kernel. And the question is, can I have multiple concurrent kernel control paths in flight at the same time? If you can, then you have a reentrant re kernel, okay? And so non-reentrant kernels are not very appealing because they are really slow and constraining in what can overlap with what. Like if you have a, a software trap 
handler running? Are your hardware interrupts not being serviced? That makes for a slower, less responsive kernel. You'd like a hardware interrupt to be able to interrupt a software track and so forth. Okay, so virtually all modern operating systems are reentrant. Pintos is reentrant, and this is uh, sometimes to the consternation of students. Uh, you may end up with up to three kernel control paths due to traps, interrupts, faults. And uh, then you may also have other kernel control paths from kernel threads running in the background. So not too bad, I think. It's, uh, it's not horrible. It's, it's not too bad, I would say. Um, so yeah, it's, it is an extremely common occurrence that you have um, overlapping control paths inside the kernel. So you make a system call as a program and you pass pointers to your program, your processes address space, but the kernel hasn't actually allocated pages for those uh, addresses yet. That's a very common kind of situation because we'd like to assign physical memory on demand so that we can um, maximally provide to all the programs that are actually running at any given time. So inside the trap handler, you may run into a page fault because you access an address that hasn't yet uh, been associated with a physical page frame. So that happens pretty frequently. Uh, the kernel control path will suspend while the disk controller is fetching the data. Because remember, the disk controller may take uh, hundreds of thousands to tens of millions of clocks. So we can definitely be doing something else. So that control path just suspends and the kernel scheduler switches to some other control path and continues running it while the page is being fetched, okay? Also, I may be inside the kernel and a timer interrupt goes off, or I may be in a trap handler and the trap handler accesses memory, generating a fault. Now the fault handler is running some stuff and the timer interrupt handler goes off. So there you can have three levels of nesting pretty easily, okay? So as you think about this, you can imagine that's gonna be consuming space on the kernel thread stack. So you need to make sure the kernel thread stack is large enough to support these levels of nested kernel invocations without overflowing and trampling over the data at the bottom and you know wreaking general havoc on your on your OS uh, kernel implementation. Now I wanted to dive a little bit into this as well. Um, Generally, kernel control paths start with a trap or a hardware interrupt because you're moving from user space and user mode into the kernel to handle something. Or if you're already in the kernel, you may be dealing with a fault or you may be dealing with a hardware interrupt. And so something else was going on and you have an interrupt and you have to go service the interrupt and then go back to the thing you were doing in the kernel. And so... Uh, I wanted to go through the mechanism so that you can see it because I think it's important and valuable to understand it. Again, there are parts of the Pintos threading implementation that when you see them, if you understand the stuff in this series of slides, you'll have a good sense of what's actually going on. So um, IA32, like many um, processors with protected mode execution, has multiple stacks. It has one per protection level so that the user process can do whatever crazy stuff to its stack and that won't mess up the kernel because the kernel is insulated. So we switch stacks. It's a nice safety mechanism. And I mean, if you have a user program that fills up its entire stack and then your kernel had to depend on using the user stack, you'd be in trouble. So it's great for the kernel to have a separate isolated stack to do its own thing. So as it says here on the slide, the trapper interrupt causes the CPU to switch to the kernel mode stack associated with this process. So that's because we're changing protection levels. If we were already in the kernel, we'd just keep using the kernel stack. But since we're switching from user mode to kernel mode, we switch stacks as well. And so you have the user process associated with the kernel thread. And so we just um, switch now to the kernel threads context. Now, the way that this works is 
a hardware mechanism. So the processor does this for you. The first thing that it does when it's handling the interrupt is it records the stack that it's switching from. So it stores the stack segment and the stack pointer. This is the uh, IA32 protected mode uh, memory addressing mechanism, which we haven't talked about in depth. You don't really need to know about it much, but um, that points to the top of stack for the other um, stack that you're coming from. And not only that, again, this is not uh, something that you can tell just from the slide, but the CPU can tell from the stack segment that there was a protection level change. So it actually knows when to switch back to the other stack because it can tell that from the stack segment information. Okay, uh, you will notice here, nothing is written onto the user process stack when the trap or the interrupt is invoked. So the user process stack is pretty much pristine. The kernel can touch it if it wants to, but it doesn't have to. Then the CPU definitely doesn't do any of that by default. So, um, yeah, so this is another little detail. When you're staying on the same protection level, this is actually not entirely correct. I may need to go back and edit this slide. But um, the CPU also saves a little bit of other information onto the stack. The flags register, we won't go into why, but imagine you are in the middle of a comparison and an interrupt goes off and your comparison flags are set. And then when you IRET, you wanna finish the comparison and do your conditional operation. Well, you need to save the flags. Uh, also, the instruction pointer of the code that was interrupted is saved onto the kernel thread stack. So you have all this information on here. And what's interesting about this is that all the kinds of interrupts that the processor understands are handled the same up to this point. At this point, you start having a bit of a variation. And so faults will sometimes push an error code. Why are we faulting onto the stack? Page fault is a great example of that. It pushes an error code onto the stack saying, this is the kind of fault that occurred. The memory isn't mapped. You violated the protection of the memory. You tried to execute something that's not ex uh, executable, or you tried to write to something that's read only. So that'll be stored in the error code. Now, um, to make the OS implementation simpler, we basically set up a dummy error code for anything that isn't a fault handler. Basically that way the structure always looks the same to the OS handlers, okay? And so you can see the little note here, threads interstubs.s has all that information for setting up the kernel thread stack when we're interrupting into the kernel, okay? So, if you're a fault handler and you push an error code, that's just straight from the CPU. If you're not a fault handler and it doesn't push an error code, then the OS interrupt handler stub will put a little dummy error code, typically zero, just to say, you know, hey, it's a dummy value. Okay. Same thing with traps. No biggie here. So, um, the thing that handles the interrupt is assembly code because as usual, you kind of can't write this in C. C doesn't understand the uh, x86 interrupt service routine calling convention by default. So you have to write a little bit of assembly code as a shim or a bridge that gets you from assembly into C. And we definitely want to write our handlers in C because who wants to write a bunch of assembly code? I mean, that's kind of the whole point of all the stuff that we give you is so you can write C for most of the work in this class. So the interrupt service routine has a little bit of assembly code to get us into C. And then um, basically what happens, yeah, so all of this kind of stuff. Oh yeah, so I forgot about this thing. Um, this is kind of a neat little thing. The stub also records the actual interrupt number. You might remember that the way that x86 works on 32-bit anyway, uh, OSs will provide a specific handler for applications to use to trap into the kernel. So Pintos is 30 hex, uh, Linux, 32-bit Linux is 80 hex. And so 
any other interrupt could also go off. And so the interrupt number itself is also stored onto the stack so that the handler knows what interrupt was being invoked. Okay, now um, the interrupt service routine is interrupting some other control flow, quite possibly. At the very least, it's gonna be the user process. The user process will be using its other registers. So we'd like to save that stuff. If we're interrupting another kernel control flow, we need to save the other control flows register state. You know, we don't need to save the stack pointer state because that's already been preserved, but uh, we just have to save the state of the thing that we interrupted. And so that will also be pushed onto the stack, okay? So you can see now that all the information on the stack is sufficient to go back to whatever was interrupted. We've got the register state. We, we can uh, look at the interrupt number and the error code to figure out what we're supposed to do. We have the instruction pointer or the program counter of the interrupted code. So we can go back to that instruction, the next instruction. We have the flags register, we have the stack pointer. We have all that stuff stored on the thread stack so that we can go back when we're done doing whatever interrupted the task that was just going on. I hope everybody gets this because this is such a cool idea and how you can take a machine and you can basically uh, time multiplex the processor across a bunch of logical tasks so that those tasks don't have to know about each other. The OS kernel knows how to save and restore those machine contexts of interrupted tasks so that we can easily switch between them. And this is one of the most cool things I think about the way kernels work. Okay, now you have all the state and I might mention this is not to scale. If you think about this, uh, you know, what's the size of all this stuff? The way that I drew it, it's like the stack is, you know, it has no more space left on it, but this will maybe be uh, 36, 48 bytes, something like that. Maybe a few more bytes, depending on what you're saving. And that makes it very easy for the kernel to do its thing and have plenty of stack space. Uh, another thing that I might mention is Pintos doesn't know anything about floating point. Floating point has its own set of registers on x86. And if you're writing a real OS, that would also be saved just in case your kernel needed to use floating point. So it really kind of depends on what facilities on the processor you're taking advantage of in the kernel. You would wanna make sure that you also save those registers. But since Pintos is simple and doesn't use floating point, you know, it just needs to save the integer registers and the other essential execution state. Okay, so um, this th the point on the slide is also really cool. This set of information on the stack is also uh, exposed to the interrupt service routine, okay? So the interrupt service routine has a specific kind, uh, like a, a definition of a data structure that exposes all of this information so that the ISR can look up what is the interrupt number? What is the error code? So the fault handler is written in C and it gets this interframe thing in Pintos and it can look at what the faulting uh, error was. Is it a protection fault? Is it a page fault? And then the fault handler can do the right thing based on what the CPU said happened. So this is really a neat mechanism here. ISR does whatever it needs to. And then basically what happens is we now need to leave the kernel. And so, or we need to leave the interrupt handler, the trap handler. So um, you can imagine if this happens where a kernel control flow is running and then an interrupt occurs or a fault occurs in that kernel control flow, this process is just repeated. And so this huge chunk of data that you have here on the kernel thread stack, huge, 48 bytes or whatever, how many ever bytes it is, just gets repeated for the new thing that interrupted the old thing. So you get the context of the interrupted thing saved below the, the thing that it interrupted, and then you have the uh, the frames for the, the interrupt handler, okay? So it's really straightforward. Um, as I say on the slide, the only difference here is that since you're already in kernel mode, um, you're not switching stacks. So I have to be careful. 
you do save the stack pointer, but I think I, so. I think this information is actually incorrect now that I look at it. I'm going to have to go back and and uh, review that to make sure that it's correct. I'm pretty sure it's always there. Okay, so you can see that the kernel thread stack size constrains the level of nested kernel control paths that you can have, and typically. Um, the deepest you'll see, and definitely the deepest you'll see in Pintos is three levels. Like I said, you'll have a trap, and then uh, it could be interrupted by a fault, and then the fault could be interrupted by a hardware interrupt, and that's about the deepest that you'll ever see. The question is, is the assembly code used to invoke the interrupt service routine also stored on the stack? Um, the interrupt service routine itself is part of the kernel's program text. So it is not stored on the stack. It's going to be stored elsewhere in memory. That's what the kernel's bootloader is responsible for sucking into memory off the disk and putting into a specific address range. And so that's where all the kernel code is, including the code for the interrupt service routines. It's all part of the kernel that's loaded off the um, disk. And so the kernel thread information is dynamic. It's determined at runtime. So it's dynamically allocated by the kernel um, using this thing called a uh, page allocator because we're allocating virtual memory pages. So I hope that answers that question. The other one, uh, what is the purpose of the interrupt number? The main reason you'll see the interrupt number in the interrupt service routine is because you can have one routine that services many interrupts. x86 has 256 hardware interrupts. And many of them, you know, it, it, when you're implementing an OS, many of them will have their own dedicated interrupt service routine. You'll have something like uh, the fault handler will be registered at one or maybe two hardware interrupts. And that's all the fault handler handles. The trap handler will be registered at one interrupt number. But then you have a whole bunch of basically unassigned or unused interrupt numbers. And all of those will be handled by a single interrupt handler that basically says some weird interrupt occurred and we don't know what it is. We're logging it and then going back. And so it'll say that was this interrupt number. Also, you have certain error handlers that all basically are handled the same way. Illegal instruction, divide by zero. Uh, I'm trying to remember what else, but uh, you'll have a number of these kinds of weird errors that can occur and they can all be handled by one service routine since the response is always the same, but it's still useful to know which interrupt was invoked. And so that's how the interrupt number is used by the interrupt service routine. Basically all of this is not necessary for you to tinker with but it is helpful for you to understand it because you will have to look at this code and it would be nice if you understand generally what's going on under the hood. So that's why we're talking about it today. So I hope, I hope that answers those questions. Okay, um, so going back to this topic of kernel control paths, um, they can overlap because we'd like to have a re-entrant kernel. And so we need to make sure that if they access shared state, which hint, they do, uh, we need to make sure that the uh, overlapping logical flows of these kernel control paths don't trample each other. They, they almost like, if you think about the scheduler, the scheduler has some data structures for the ready queue, blocked queues and so forth. And that is shared across multiple things. The timer interrupt handler can kick a process or kick a thread off of the CPU. And a trap handler may also invoke the scheduler. So you have two kernel control paths that could be working with the same data. So this is where you have to be careful about how these things interact with the shared state inside the, uh, the kernel. So there's a question that I will ask over and over again in this class when you're dealing with problems, which is, what can interrupt what? Because there are constraints. If something can be interrupted by something else, then you need to think about how to keep them from stepping on each other's toes. But if one thing can never be interrupted by another thing, then you don't have to worry about synchronizing access to shared state because you know they can never 
get access to the same thing in an overlapping control flow that would generate bugs, okay? So this question of what can interrupt what becomes super important when you're talking about kernels and concurrency and understanding how to resolve concurrency issues. We also need to understand how to achieve synchronization. Now you may be sitting there and thinking, okay, I've done some threaded programming. I've done some concurrency programming in my day. So I understand what a mutex is and I understand what a, let's say a condition variable or something like that is. You can't always use those mechanisms in the kernel. There's circumstances where you're not allowed to use them because they'll hang your OS. So this is the exciting part. You have to understand the, the context of what you're doing and also what can interrupt what. And if you understand those things as you go through the implementation, you will generally find it straightforward to resolve issues that you encounter along the way. Okay, what kernel control paths are allowed to block? This is a major question, okay? Now, when you say that you're blocking a kernel, because we already talked about this a little bit, right? We talked about this in the context of threads and system calls, many system calls block until they're completed. And what that really means is if the system call takes a long time, the kernel can switch to something else and do it while we're waiting. And then when that operation completes, we can switch back to the process that made the blocking call. So are we allowed necessarily to block any old control path through the kernel? Here's the big one, hardware interrupts. And uh, I have to be careful, uh, hardware fault handlers, you have to, um, are a little bit different, but hardware interrupts cannot passively wait. Like your timer tick handler cannot passively wait. If you can't passively wait, then that means you can't acquire a mutex because part of the way mutexes work is if they're not available, you block. It's the same thing with memory allocation. If you are performing a memory allocation inside of a hardware interrupt handler, then either that allocation must succeed or it must fail immediately. You can't end up faulting and waiting for a page fault to be resolved because you're in a hardware interrupt handler. Hardware interrupt handlers have to run to completion, period. That's just the way that they have to work. You have to get them done immediately and return so that you can go back to whatever you were doing before. So what this means if you're not allowed to acquire locks inside of a hardware interrupt handler, um, you can't use locks to guard shared state. Okay, well, if I'm in an interrupt handler and I need to access shared state, how do I know it's okay for me to do it? This is the thing that you have to think about. So uh, in the OS kernel, you have one special trick that you can perform that nobody else is really allowed to uh, perform which is that you can turn off hardware interrupts. Like if you're in a hardware interrupt handler and you're dealing with shared state and you're like, I know somebody else could interrupt me and mangle the shared state, like do it in an uncontrolled manner, I'll just turn off interrupts. Now I know nobody can interrupt me and I'll do my thing and then I'll turn interrupts back on and then other people are allowed to access the shared state. So this is one of those things where you have to be really careful with how you actually manage access to shared state inside of a kernel. So we call this idea the context of the kernel control path. And so you'll see people use the phrase process context. When we're in process context, it means that the kernel control path is, is executing on behalf of a user mode process. User processes can be blocked at any time. We absolutely have no problem blocking user processes. It's not gonna destroy the universe if the process stops executing for a while, okay? So like it says here, the kernel is executing code on behalf of a specific process and the kernel control path, if it's in process context, is allowed to block because the effect will be that the process is also perceived to block because we're not scheduling the kernel 
thread anymore until whatever blocking thing unblocks. Now, trap handlers obviously run in process context because you're trapping into the kernel. Who's trapping in? The process. It's making a system call. Fault handlers also often run in process context because it's something that the user process did that generated the fault. It accessed a memory address, causing a page fault. It tried to execute an illegal instruction, generating uh, a fault on the illegal instruction. It divided by zero. If you think about it, the kernel should never do those things. The kernel shouldn't get an illegal instruction fault. The kernel shouldn't generate a divide by zero. Otherwise, our kernel's buggy. So, but it's perfectly reasonable for a user process to generate those behaviors. I mean, anything goes really when it comes to user processes. So if the kernel code was invoked because a hardware interrupt occurred, then we say that it's running in interrupt context. And if you are in interrupt context, you are not allowed to block. You must run to completion, okay? You have to be sure, like the, <laughs> the amount of time the interrupt handler takes has to be bounded somehow, okay? Now, um, there are very interesting things about this that I'll talk about um, in a future lecture. I think it may be the next lecture, um, but there are ways that you can do locking in hardware interrupt handlers, but they're really only relevant in the context of multiple processors. If you're on a single processor, you basically don't use locks. And similarly, all of your memory allocations should always, like you should always know that they will succeed and you'll never generate a page fault or something like that. Because uh, if a hardware interrupt handler page faults, then that handler has to wait. It's blocked until um, the page load occurs and that would be really slow. So modern OSs, I mentioned this in some other slide of, I can't remember which lecture, but um, Linux, for example, in its hardware interrupt handlers, um, it will allow them to allocate memory, but it has a special memory pool that's already set up so that the allocations are known to always succeed. Or the hardware interrupt handler will simply set aside or the OS will set aside the data, the buffers necessary for the hardware interrupt handler to work so that the handler can always run to completion without any potential of being blocked. So this is a really key detail. You'll be thinking about this a lot as you go through your implementation. Am I in process context? Am I in interrupt context? Okay, here's another uh, question. Are interrupt handlers allowed to overlap? Okay, so you could ask the question for software generated interrupts. You could ask the question for hardware generated interrupts. So software exceptions uh, basically are always allowed to be interrupted. We would like to service hardware interrupts immediately because that makes for a very responsive kernel. So that, that is simply another way of saying the kernel is re-entering. Um, in general, hardware interrupts don't overlap hardware interrupts as long as you're relying on the default behaviors of the processor. So there's two mechanisms on IA30, um, it's on all x86 processors. I don't know why I say IA32, except that that's the specific Pintos context. But um, there's two mechanisms that prevent hardware interrupts from overlapping. The first one is that when a hardware interrupt service routine is invoked, interrupts are turned off on the processor. And when you return from the interrupt service routine, it automatically re-enables hardware interrupts. There's this flag called the interrupt flag and it's automatically cleared when the interrupt is being serviced. And then it's just restored when the interrupt service routine returns, okay? So if you do this, then no hardware interrupt is allowed to interrupt any other hardware interrupt, okay? So, uh, and, I, and I hope you understood what I said there. No hardware interrupt is allowed to interrupt any other hardware interrupt, okay? Now the handler can, re-enable hardware interrupts if it wants to. Uh, modern OSs do this, Pintos does not. You really don't need to worry about hardware interrupt handlers uh, interrupting other hardware interrupt handlers. Now there's a second mechanism is that the interrupt controller itself 
has a flag for each interrupt type so that uh, one instance of a certain interrupt type can't interrupt another instance of the same interrupt type. And the way that this works is that the handler has to acknowledge receipt of the interrupt on the interrupt controller. Okay, and so as I say here on the slide, the thing that the interrupt service routine can do is acknowledge the interrupt as its very last step. And if it does that, then you will never have multiple occurrences of the same interrupt interrupting the interrupt service routine for that interrupt. That was a lot of uses of the word interrupt, but I hope I made it clear. Okay. Pintos does rely on both mechanisms. So hardware interrupts are not allowed to overlap in Pintos, but it does allow software interrupts and faults to be interrupted by hardware interrupts, okay? And so what this means is if you're in a trap handler or you're in a fault handler and you're mucking with shared state and there is an interrupt service routine that could go off and also muck with the same shared state, turn off interrupts then the hardware interrupt handler can't run. And then once you're done mucking with the shared state, you turn the interrupts back on and the hardware interrupt handlers are allowed to run and they won't uh, mangle the shared state. This is gonna be really important for the first, uh, for the threading project, because um, you know when you have this uh, waiting system call that you need to make, uh, make do passive waiting, well, the timer interrupt handler will look at the list of waiting threads and the sleep call will also muck with the list of waiting threads. So that's shared state. And the easy thing to do inside the system call is just turn off interrupts so that the timer can't go off while you're uh, mo modifying the uh, shared data structure. Easy enough, right? Okay, um, modern operating systems will allow you to turn on um, hardware interrupts while you're in a, in a hardware interrupt handler, but they tend to still leave uh, off the capability of a hardware interrupt to interrupt its own self. So, cause usually that means your handler is running too slowly. It actually is a, a sign of a bug rather than uh, correct behavior. Okay, I hope that made sense. If anyone has any questions, please ask, cause this is gonna be important for your life, this assignment. Okay, um, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about how Linux implements all this stuff. It has hardware interrupts grouped into three different categories. You have critical interrupts that have to be handled immediately. And so those always get to run with all other hardware interrupts disabled. So they get to go right away. Then you have non-critical interrupts, which are um, allowed to have other kinds of hardware interrupts interrupt a given type of handler but it won't interrupt itself because as I said, that tends to be a sign of a buggy implementation. Then you have this third kind, which is quite fascinating. It's non-critical uh, non deferrable interrupts. And this is where you have hardware that says, hey, something happened and you need to deal with it eventually, but you don't need to deal with it immediately. That's the reason for the term deferrable here. And so since we want to make sure we get future occurrences of that hardware interrupt, we want to go ahead and acknowledge immediately that it occurred, but we don't necessarily do the other tasks associated with the interrupt handler immediately, okay? So um, the way that this is typically implemented is with this thing called soft IRQs, which basically the way that these non-critical deferrable interrupts work is the handler registers a function to be called later on. And so that's why it's called a soft IRQ because the response doesn't happen immediately in the interrupt handler. It's just, here's a function. Will you please run it later to deal with this thing that happened? Okay. And so they can be batched up either at the end of uh, some IO interrupt or they can be executed by this special daemon called K soft IRQD. You may have seen this before. I definitely have seen it before I knew what it did, that it was handling this uh, you know, non-critical deferrable interrupt mechanism. Uh, this kind of thing appears in many OSs. 
I have different categorizations of hardware interrupts and some I just don't need to handle right away. So I will just queue up something that says this task occurred and I need to deal with the results and you just queue it up and then you return from the interrupt service routine so that other important things can happen, okay? And so you'll sometimes uh, see these terms, um, first level handlers uh, or upper half handlers, second level handlers, lower or bottom half handlers, okay? Okay, so let's see, what are we talking? Yeah, so um, given the time, I, uh, I'm trying to remember what else I talk about here that's like super important because I am kind of getting, I'm gonna skip over some of this stuff. Uh, I'm telling you already that um, hardware interrupts, you don't really need to worry about interrupting other hardware interrupts. So I'm gonna skip over some of this discussion. Um, the, the key detail here is that Linux, since it allows us, keeps track of the preemption count. How many times has the kernel preempted itself? And it can use that value to tell where it is in the process and what it needs to do when it returns from each interrupt service routine. So I'm gonna skip over this because it's not super important. Um, this concept is though, what do we mean by a preemptive kernel or a non-preemptive kernel, okay? Uh, since we do allow kernel control paths to overlap, the question is where do we do context switches? Where do we switch from one process to another process? Okay, um, the way that we can do this very easily is to have a specific point in the kernel control path. So I'm doing something on behalf of a process and toward the end of it, I can have a place where I always context switch to another process. You know, after you've run the, uh, the kernel operation on behalf of the process's request, after you've run the scheduler, now you have a specific point where you do the, the process context switch. So we call that a scheduled process switch, okay? And if we only allow process context switches to occur at that one point, then we have a non-preemptive kernel. Basically what we're saying is the kernel can't preempt itself, okay? These are shades and nuances of implementation, and I'm gonna say that right up front. So you may wanna spend some time thinking about this a little bit, reviewing it. But if we only have this one place in our kernel where we do the process context switch, then that is a non-preemptive kernel, okay? Preemptive kernels can basically interrupt any part of the kernel to switch to some other process uh, and so this is a little bit more fancy. And so uh, preemptive kernels, most modern operating systems are preemptive, but thankfully Pintos is not. So the example that I have here in the slide is process A is doing a system call. Maybe some uh, data showed up on behalf of the process, the kernel is copying it into the process's address space, okay? Now that takes a little bit of time because we're copying data. Then something happens and another process is allowed to proceed because the uh, interrupt signals completion of some important uh, background step. And so the uh, interrupt handler can actually force a context switch from the lower priority process A, even though it's inside the kernel, to the higher priority process B, okay? Now, if you think about the um, non-preemptive kernel, all we would do is just say, hey, you need to switch to another process. We wouldn't do it right away though. And that's the difference between a non-preemptive and a preemptive kernel, okay? So the preemptive kernel can interrupt another process's um, kernel control flow at any time, okay? And the reason why we do this is if we have really critical timing constraints where we need to have the process that corresponds to a certain event run as quickly as possible. That's why we don't care if Pintos is not preemptive because we don't have like these super critical timing constraints that we're worried about in Pintos, okay? So yeah, um, real-time processes, real-time operating systems have preemptive kernels because typically you want to get your latency as small as possible when you're handling 
uh, events. And it does definitely make things a little bit more complicated inside uh, the kernel implementation. Okay, that question, what interrupts what? That becomes a complicated question to answer when you allow kernel preemption and you have to think about it very carefully. Okay, um, let's see. So this definitely talks about that kind of stuff. Um, I already talked a little bit about this, so I'm gonna go on. So you can re read about this in your own time. And if you run into questions then you can certainly um, you know, ask me about that later. So preemptive kernel versus non-preemptive kernel. It really is all about where do we allow process switches? Non-preemptive kernels have one place in the kernel where you switch processes so it's easy to reason about. Okay, let's see. Um, yeah, so this is, yeah, and you don't need to think about this either. We're, you know, you can review it another time. We certainly don't need to talk about it. Okay, uh, last thing to talk about today is uh, kernel synchronization. It's clear that we have this situation where shared state may be manipulated from multiple logical control flows. So we need to think about how to do this. Um, we also have this problem that different contexts disallow certain tools or allow certain tools. So we have to think about what tools we can use in different contexts. We're gonna talk about this a lot next time, okay? And as I say here on the slide, you're gonna run into concurrency issues. I can virtually guarantee it unless you very carefully plan every stage of your implementation and you understand everything inside out, upside and down, which is not gonna happen. It's just life, right? You're learning. So um, when you run into problems, you need to understand all the pieces and these kinds of questions. What can interrupt what? Hardware uh, interrupt context? Is it process context? You need to understand all of these different details so that you can figure out how to solve the problems effectively. Okay, the example of Pintos is, it's got maskable hardware interrupts, which can never interrupt each other. So hardware interrupts never overlap. Uh, hardware interrupts can interrupt software exceptions. And the Pintos kernel is reentrant, but not preemptive. So you always have that one location where uh, process switches occur. Okay, so, um, Let's see, I wanna, I think what I'll do is go ahead and stop because we're at 155, or let me see what, uh, we'll talk about these few things. You've probably heard of the concept of a race condition where basically you have two logical control flows accessing the same state and the outcome depends on which order they make it to the shared state. And that's always a sign of badness. So unfortunately, these kinds of bugs don't always manifest because they're timing dependent. And so a lot of times you'll hear people call them Heisen bugs because they go away when you look at them. And it's infuriating when you put a print statement into a piece of code to figure out why it's failing and the failure goes away. It's like you change the timing and now the bug has gone away. So these are frustrating to detect, but uh, um, usually you can suss them out relatively quickly. The simple example, we'll talk about this and then we'll wrap for the day, is if you have two threads executing the simple increment operation, i equals i plus one. And the thing that confuses people about this is they don't realize that i may be in memory somewhere, typically is loaded into a register, incremented, and then written back to memory. So since you have these multiple steps, you can end up with different interleavings that produce incorrect results sometimes. So thread one loads I into a register, you switch to T2, it also loads I into a register. Now the two threads are doing the same thing, but they haven't coordinated their access. So T2 increments the value, stores it back, and then we switch back to thread one, and it also increments and then stores the value back. But the problem is T1 doesn't know that T2 has already completed its uh, sequence. And so you see the final result is that I is not incremented twice, it's only incremented once. Well, we incremented it twice, but the, the first one was lost. So we need tools to deal with this kind of thing. And I guess I will go ahead and switch to the last slide because what we're gonna talk about next time is how we actually can build synchronization into the kernel as it executes and make sure that everything runs properly without stepping on each other's toes. So if you have any questions, let me know. I'll hang out.
Otherwise, I will see you next time.